Back to the sermon. Today is not yesterday. Uh, I'm also guessing most of you tend to not really live that way. I know I don't always live that way. And I could complicate this and say, by association, that tomorrow will not be today. Is this hard today? Uh, this is difficult math, I know. Tomorrow's not yesterday. God didn't give you grace to live tomorrow. He gave you grace to live today. And you and I have probably both known examples of people who get this confused. Like hoarders. Uh, there, there was a couple that lived down the street from me when I was a child. They, my, my mom actually witnessed to them, and they eventually started coming to our church and, and were saved. And one time... I knew they had a lot of stuff because their car was packed full. They could hardly fit into the car themselves. And they would go to all these garage sales and things, and they would buy, 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 and they would stick it in the car. And so I was in a shop class, and I needed to repair something. So I, I went to their house and said, hey, do you have something that doesn't work that I could repair? And when they invited me into their house, there was no furniture. It was in their their garage, when they opened the garage, it was top to bottom, side to side, back to front, full of boxes of things. When you walk in their front door, you walk between boxes to get through the house, and they were just things stacked all over the place, no place to really sit. My mom guessed that they grew up or had some kind of connection with the depression. A lot of people who went through the depression were so deprived during that time that they, they can't help but protect themselves. They need more things because we might not have something tomorrow. Now, some of us may be beginning to empathize with these people. Some of you have hoarded toilet paper recently. <laughs> there is a danger in fearing that today is going to be like yesterday. Now, we can't be idiots and, and not learn from history. But if I'm afraid of what happened to me before, I can't even enjoy today, or I'm afraid tomorrow's going to be like yesterday, then I don't live in the, the, the day that God has given me. This is the day the Lord's made. Let me be glad and rejoice in it. Now, something to chew on as you adjust to more political upheaval and possibly government overreach in our world. Natural and political disasters have often been the means by which God has brought countries to their knees. I don't like to believe that's going to happen. But God's promise is a great revival. How do you think He's going to get people to turn to Him if prosperity hasn't worked? Have you ever seen a prosperous country who became more religious, more spiritual? Have you ever met anybody who, who their prosperity, they got a better job, they got a raise, they got everything was going their way? How many people ran to God when that happened? Think Elijah. I mentioned this recently, but it's just been on my mind, and the other day I came across this uh, timeline, and I saw some things I never realized before, and that is that Elijah uh, brought Elisha into his life, and after Elijah went to Mount Carmel and called fire down from heaven, you would have thought that broke the curse of Jezebel. But it didn't. Elijah, evidently something happened in the spirit realm, but Elijah went into depression because even though he had prayed his best, and even though he had done his best, it didn't seem to dislodge that wicked queen. And then Elijah lived for 23 years with Elisha alongside him, and that's when most of Elisha's miracles happened. Elijah was just kind of a Bible school teacher tucked away in the background somewhere. And Elisha was actually the one who anointed a prophet, one of the Bible school students, to go anoint Jehu. And Jehu finally dethroned Jezebel after Elijah had died. So... So to spoil some of what I'm going to talk about today, some of you have prayed and some of you have 
have felt like you broke through something in the spirit world and you, you thought it was going to affect our country one way or the other, I'm here to say, don't judge that. You don't know how long it takes. You don't know what God is going to do. You don't know how that's going to unfold. And that's why when we prayed, we prayed, God, your will be done. Because of the stubbornness of mankind, we often have to experience consequences of our sin for a good while before we finally come to our senses like the prodigal did and go find Jesus. That's just the way mankind works. Some people never come to their senses. Some people do come to their senses. And then there's a few people that their hearts are so hard that God even turns against them like Pharaoh and Jezebel, and God just has to judge them. So I remind you of a very simple concept we've talked about many times. This is not heaven. And our prayers will never make it heaven. Believers usually go through difficult times alongside unbelievers. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago when the, Israelite, when the Israelites were brought out of Egypt. First, what had to happen is the plagues. And during the first few plagues, the Israelites went through everything that the Egyptians went through. And then it got worse for them. It seemed to backfire. Some of you are relating to this right now. You, you feel like, boy, we prayed, and man, we're a powerful group of people, and we touched heaven, and, and then what happened? What happened is the same thing that happened when Moses showed up and said, let my people go. The enemy dug in, and the enemy has some clout, especially with flesh. So believers usually go through those difficult times alongside the unbelievers, but they have to, at that time, like Moses was able to do, and finally he got the elders to do, and some, enough people in Israel to do, they had to quit judging God by what was happening right then. They had to believe that even though Pharaoh has dug in, even though it looks bad, we're still getting ready to leave this place. And I'm still believing for a worldwide harvest. So I'm going to read our text, but it may take just a minute or two for you to understand the connection with what I just said in the text. Our text is even shorter than my title. It's one of the shortest scriptures in the Bible, so I'll have you read it with me, please. Pray without ceasing. One more time. Pray without ceasing. I, I felt to start with the sermon today because I want to give you ammunition so that when we go into a time of worship... You can have the faith and the courage and the trust to expel all of that, that junk that maybe you picked up over the week. To get rid of the, the, the things that may have encroached on you after you had a great battle and now it's like, oh no, maybe, maybe God didn't hear my prayer. We, we need to get over that. God heard every single prayer that was prayed. Let's ask God for His help. God, we need You today. We need Your wisdom. We need Your understanding. We need Your courage. We need Your perspective. We need Your revelation. I pray, God, that You would allow Your Word to do its work. You would give everyone in this room the strength and the direction that they need today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I think most of you have probably learned that we need to be careful which lessons we let life teach us. Let me ask you just, just to think with me for a minute. Will today or tomorrow necessarily be like yesterday? Let me put it simpler. Was 2020 like 2019? <laughs> Nothing like it. Now, we're not so happy about that, but it proves that today is not always like yesterday. How is it different? Well, there's a lot of things that have changed over the years. A lot of the things, a lot of things that's changed forever. How many in this room, for example, don't have a house phone? Raise your hand. You don't have a house phone? Look, look around you. Everybody used to have a house phone. What happened? Don't need it. This is today. Yesterday you needed a phone. And the longer the cord, the, you know, the greater it was. You could walk around the whole house. 
Farmers used to have to work from dusk to dawn, and they still do, but they, they used to have to go out and, well, they, they pull plows behind mules and, and oxen. And, and today, if you have a big spread, like up in Montana, you, you sit in an air-conditioned cab and you drive this big diesel around your fields doing everything that it's supposed to do. It, it, it does all of the work. You just have to have the right kind of attachments. Not like yesterday. This is today. Most people today don't wait for marriage to join physically together. That's anti-biblical, but it's today. And it's more accepted worldwide than it has ever been. Most, uh, much of America today is leaning socialist. That's something that blows my mind. I would have never thought of that growing up. But this is today. And I'm not saying we should just say, oh, well, whatever will be, will be. But I am saying things change. God doesn't change. God never changes. God is always the same. God is the anchor. He's that strong tower that we can hang on to. So how about when it comes to prayer? I've known situations where prayer doesn't seem to change things. I've, I've shared with you stories like when I was a child and my, I was eight years old and my, my friend who the whole church was praying for, he had complications and he had diabetes and a few things like that and, and he died with everybody praying. Every, people were standing around his bedside praying when he died. When uh, a year before my son was born, 1986, my mother had been battling cancer. At that time, all five of us children were in ministry positions in churches. And so there were five churches praying for her, plus her own church that I know of, and even more than that. So at least six or seven churches were praying for my mother, desperately praying that God would heal her of cancer, and she died. Brother Haney who was our general superintendent for eight years. He built one of the premier churches in our, our fellowship. Huge church. He was known as a man of faith. Everybody looked to him as a man of faith. And after he uh, was superintendent and someone else, Brother Bernard, was voted in, he, he got a, a brain tumor. And now millions of people probably were praying for him around the world. And he died. So should I conclude from yesterday that when you pray, God doesn't heal? The answer is no. Since then, I have prayed for people who are healed of diabetes. Yes. I have personally, I have prayed for people who had cancer. Uh, Latrice's uncle, uh, we in a prayer group, he, he didn't even come to church that I remember, in a prayer group we prayed for him and God healed him of cancer. Brother Savory has a story of God healing him of cancer. Peter Noheimer has a story of God healing him of cancer. Brother Hart has a story of God healing him of cancer. He heals. When Sister Jolin was in a head-on collision, she, she went to the very brink of death. She should have died, probably. Well, uh, God didn't heal her legs. She's still got metal in her legs. She still deals with pain from that, but he kept her alive. And then later she had a cyst or tumor, I don't know what they called it, uh, and, and we prayed, and as far as we know, that's taken care of too. So God heals. We've seen it. So, so should I assume that every time I pray for healing, there'll be a healing? The answer is no. We heard it last week. God is sovereign. I bring it to Him, and He decides yay or nay. It's up to Him. He's good whether He says yay or whether He says nay. He's right whether He says yay or whether He says nay. If we pray, Thy will be done, and it happens differently than we expect, you can be sure His will was done. 
Now, that doesn't mean what happened was what he wanted to happen, but it meant he intervened as much as he decided to intervene. So I heard uh, last week, good and strong from both of the speakers, God is sovereign, we can trust him. And when I heard that, I was coupling only with the prayers I prayed, and I thought, yeah, God's sovereign, and I prayed some prayers, and I'm expecting this, this, and this, and this. I, I, I kind of expected some things from that prayer. And, you know, it's, I don't know, maybe the things I expected will still come to pass. But I have to get off the judge's bench and quit trying to decide whether God came through or not. He came through. God has been faithful. I don't know what's going to happen, but God has been faithful. He can heal today or he can heal tomorrow, even if he didn't heal that particular person or that, that kind of sick. If there's a brand new thing like COVID that comes up, uh, great men and women of God have died of COVID, uh, but then there's been healings of COVID. COVID isn't here to judge God. America isn't here to judge God. America can bite the dust and God will still be God. America could rise to the occasion and apply biblical principles and flourish more than it's ever flourished before. It's up to them whether they're going to let God be God or not. But we're not trusting in a pattern. We're not trusting in a system. We're not figuring this thing out, and prayer is not our magic wand to make things happen. If, if you're serving God, and if you're praying to God to get Him to do your life the way you want it done, you better just go off somewhere else. The devil will make more deals with you than God like that. God will keep you in a furnace as long as you need to be in a furnace, and it doesn't matter how much junk you spout at Him, how mad you get, how hard you kick your feet, how how much you scream at heaven. If you are bucking Him, He needs to keep you in the fire. Sorry, He does that with me too. We are His sheep. And He has a rod and He has a staff. He'll bonk you on the head if you need to be bonked on the head. That's God. Almighty, loving God will bonk you on the head if you need to be bonked on the head. And He'll gently coddle you if you need to be coddled. You can count on it. If things are not going well for you, it's not God's fault. I mean, He may be making it happen, but it's not His fault. He's just responding to you. If he's given you counsel through someone who has spiritual authority in your life and you refuse the counsel and you keep wanting to make it happen your way and you're miserable, that's your fault. God gave you counsel. Who's God? We want God to be God when we need him to come pull out a rabbit out of a hat, but we don't want him to be God when he's telling us to quit throwing a fit. When I want something in my life, sometimes I grab onto prayer and I use it like it's going to be a tool and it's going to force God to do something. You're not going to force God to do anything. Who do you think you are? He is good just to hear my cry. I'm just pleased that he allows me to bring my petitions to him. My prayers are not me betting on God to be predictable and do what I ask Him to do. My prayers are me counting on God to be the loving, good, merciful, faithful, just, righteous, sovereign God that He is. When I pray to Him, I pray to Him most of the time nowadays asking Him what He wants instead of telling Him what He needs to do. The Bible is what we have to go on. We're Bible-based around here, aren't we? I hope we are. And the Bible tells me that sometimes people were healed and sometimes they weren't healed. It tells me sometimes they were sprung from prison and at other times they died in prison. It tells me sometimes they were martyred and they had their head lobbed off and sometimes they were boiled in oil and they survived. 
And he was right every time. And he was good every time. And he was faithful every time. And he was just every time. And I can, I can trust him with my situation even if he takes me where I don't want to go. He told Peter, they're going to take you where you don't want to go. Well, what about him, Lord? What's it to you? I'm going to do with him what I'll do with him, and you can trust me. We're down to the same old thing. Do we trust him? Do we trust him? Down here, I don't want to be a martyr. But up there, I might look back and say, hmm, I wish I was one of those guys who God put on a, on a pedestal up in heaven that were martyred for him. That's what he did with it. That, that's just an aside on, on that. Um, I, I just recently had a chance to uh, tour a facility that has two m major uh, branches. One branch they work for uh, the defense, and the other branch they make medical supplies. So I walked in there, and this is a building like I've, I maybe have been in some buildings like this before, but um, even without COVID, you're, you're walking through pristine halls with a, a glass, a, a whole glass thing, looking into people that are wearing, uh, you know, hair nets, boot, little pillow boots on their shoes, everything. Because they're working uh, with, they're making, um, catheters to go into your heart and uh, so the, the COO was showing me around and he was talking to me about the, these catheters and the outside of them uh, they in, they infuse them with molecules of silver some of them because silver can go into your body and your body doesn't fight it off and but the inside these catheters are that's the outside but the inside now has to be able to take these chemicals whatever chemicals they're going to be putting in there they can't be corrupted they, so it's a, it's a highly um it, it's a very well watched procedure to make these things so well um so it made me think about blueprints this week and i've i've referred to this before and there, you're going to have blueprints for how to make these things. And you've got to be able to read those blueprints. You've got to know symbols. Um, but, and if you don't know the symbol means, you don't make up what it means. Mm -hmm. um, you, you find out for sure by... Uh, there, there's a, there's a, a national standard on symbols. Uh, it actually an international standard on symbols for, for aircraft parts, for medical parts. You don't just say, well, I, I, I don't know what that shape means. Uh, you know, it means concentric, but I think it means, you know, a, a zero with another zero. So whatever I think that might mean, that's how I'm going to build this. And hopefully, you know, hopefully it comes out right. And hopefully we, <laughs> you know, we ship these catheters and hopefully they work, you know. So, so say you're in, you come out of that building and, and you saw a system like that where you got to, you got to look at the people and say, um, you know, you got to observe them saying, looking at the print and going like this and then going, eh, taking the print, crumbling it up and just saying, this is what I'm doing. And, and you got to observe that. And then all of a sudden you had a small heart attack and you go to the hospital and you, f you, see the, uh, you see in the doctor's office that the package holding the catheters has the name of that company that you just came out of. How, how, comfortable do you, how comfortably do you feel about, hmm. Well, all that to say, thank God for his word. Mm -hmm. Thank God for a man who knows how to read the word of God. And, 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 and we can learn this too. I don't have to go into that company and just say, well, I'll, I'll just, I guess I'll just do what I, I'm told. Well, that's a good thing, but you know, you can learn what those symbols right. mean too, mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. But it all boils down to 
the word of God is like that in our lives. And we can't take, you know, what the world is doing with it is they're not understanding it and they're not going to the correct authorities on it, God himself and people that have studied the word of God. So they, they're looking at a passage and saying, oh, well, love. Oh, you know what? Love is love. Um, I feel like love is whatever, you know, makes me feel good. That's what love is. But, it, but they're failing to look at the manual that's, uh, you know, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that'll tell you what love is. Right. And you'll have, right. you'll have a good idea if what you're doing is right. what love is. Right. Um, so thank God for a compass for, that can lead us right. in these times. It, it's a compass. It's, his word never changes. He never changes. Mm-hmm. We, we change. Yeah. But God's word never changes. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, knowing God can take care of a situation without being certain that he's going to take care of it my way is called trust. I'm going to say trust. trust. Who do you trust? Most of us would say we trust God. But the truth is we trust our own reasoning a little bit more than we trust God. Right? Maybe not you, but I'm just being honest. That's the way it happens with me. Faith is believing I can face tomorrow even though it's not making sense to me right now. It's a peace that passes understanding that He gives us. Remember Mark chapter 9 records the story of the man who's Son is throwing himself into the fire. He's got a devil. And he comes to Jesus. And Jesus says, Do you believe that I can heal your son or take care of the situation? And he says, Lord, I believe, but help me because I'm really, I am kind of having trouble believing. Can I get a witness here today in the room? Anybody ever find yourself in that spot? You do believe. You've seen him do it yesterday, but then you've seen him not do it yesterday too. So you're not sure which way he's going to go with you today. Well, do you trust him? Is he a good God? Is he justice? Is he faithful? Is he kind? Is... I have to trust him because he hasn't designed me to figure out the universe. I don't have a big enough brain to even figure out my own situation. I I don't understand the spirit world altogether. I get little glimpses, but only he understands all of that. Only he can take me through this world. Uh, he, He has the blueprint. He has the roadmap. And I have to let God do the heavy lifting. So sometimes when I find myself bogged down in heaviness and I'm a little discouraged and a little depressed, it's a a reminder to me that I'm trying to do God's job right now. No wonder I'm having trouble. This thing weighs two tons and I'm trying to lift it with my little frame. It wasn't The church's faith that got Peter out of jail. Just to to put you in good company. Peter's in jail, and the church goes to praying. These are people, some of them who walked with Jesus, some of them saw him do miracles, and they're praying. God, spring Peter out of jail. Now, they haven't seen him do it yesterday, but they believe God can do anything, right? And lo and behold, an angel comes, And he springs Peter out of jail. Peter comes to the door and knocks. And one of the girls goes to answer the door. And comes back and says, Peter's at the door. And they say, no, no. It's probably his angel. So they were ready to believe in an angel of Peter coming. They believe in ghosts. But they don't believe that their prayer was really going to be answered, right? That's, that's who the first church was made of, if that makes you feel any better. Sometimes I have trouble believing even when I pray. Sometimes I pray, but then when it doesn't stack up the way I thought it was going to stack up, I start recalibrating, thinking, oh, maybe, maybe I didn't pray right. Maybe, maybe God didn't really hear. Maybe, uh, maybe that prophecy was wrong, or, or on and on and on and on. We're dealing with our own flesh and our own human nature. And every once in a while, God in His mercy comes along and says, I understand, like he did the man with the boy. 
I understand. I'm going to cast the devil out of your son. People, people, including me, we have trouble doing what's good for ourselves. I, I, could I get a few more amens than that? Let me guilt trip a few of you here to help you with this. 80% of people who join a gym quit within five months. They know exercise is good for them. They're actually ready to shell out the 50 bucks a month to go to the gym. They have good intentions to do this. But 80% quit within five months. Only half of the people who have gym memberships are even regular in any way to gyms. So on average, they're spending $500 a year just to tell themselves they're really taking care of themselves. Yeah, I'm thinking about a business where you can just send me the $500 and I'll send you a card saying you're a good person every few weeks. <laughs> Health clubs raked in $94 billion in 2018. People intending to take good care of themselves. That's human nature. It's not easy to break a bad habit like eating too much. We don't have to amen on that one. Uh, there's a lot of bad habits that are really hard to break. And if I have a habit of not trusting God, it's really hard to break. I, most of us don't think we have that bad habit of not trusting God. But if you're worrying, you're not trusting God. If you're doubting, you're not trusting God. If, if you're today, if your head is spinning saying, where are you, God? Then you're not trusting God. And now, uh, let me give you another example. I've played a little bit of golf, not very much golf. Uh, what I like to do when I play golf, evidently, is take the tops of the ball off. It, it usually bounces down the fairway instead of flying beautifully down the fairway. And I'm told the reason that happens is because when, when you do your golf swing, you're supposed to hold everything right, put your feet all right, bend your knees just a little bit, which is crazy to me. Why don't they just make the golf clubs the right size so you can keep your legs straight? <laughs> You have to bend your legs a little bit, and then you, you swing, and when you swing, you're not supposed to lift your head. Well, how do you know where the ball goes? So I always lift my head. I can't stop myself from lifting my head, and so my ball always goes the wrong directions. So I don't play a lot of golf. Not a, not a very good game. It's, you know, it's... <laughs> I've tried to fix my golf swing, but I, I try. It's like, okay, don't, don't look, don't look. But I, I, I don't do it enough. I haven't practiced my swing long enough. I'm the kind of person that, to go to a batting cage or to go to a golf, uh, whatever they call those things, and, and hit and hit and hit and hit for an hour. It's like, no, this, this, I, this is too boring. Uh, I don't care enough about my golf swing to do that. Sometimes I don't care enough about my trust in God to fix that bad habit of not trusting Him. And so He takes me somewhere where I have no choice but to trust Him. Smart God. Makes me mad sometimes. Can't outwit Him. He's the... He's the teacher you can't get anything by. No spit wads at the back of his head. He knows exactly what you're doing. He's got eyes in the back of his head, more eyes than your mom had in the back of her head. He knows what's going on. God is not the problem. Flesh is the problem. My flesh is the problem. God sometimes has to let my flesh exhaust itself. And he'll say, now you ready to trust me? So what does this have to do with our text? Pray without ceasing. 
Well, I'm going to review a few things for some of you, but this may be new for others of you. That word pray, if you look at the top right hand of this slide, means interacting with God by replacing our wishes for His as He gives faith. Now, that's a lot different definition than prayer than most people have. Prayer is me learning how to replace my wishes with His wishes. I talk to Him long enough to where I'm finally saying what He's wanting instead of what I'm wanting. That's prayer. It's the kind of prayer we're talking about here. Now, without ceasing means I'm always doing that. I'm constantly replacing my will with His. I think I shouldn't have gone on here. Um, so, uh, to clarify, I'll just read this to you. To clarify, Paul is not necessarily saying you have to pray out loud or write in your prayer journal every single second of every single day. Paul is saying that the Thessalonians and us by extension need to interact with the Lord in a way that he's asking and talking, excuse me, in, in a way that is asking and talking to him about his will and what he wants to accomplish instead of our will and what we want to accomplish. It means taking the focus off ourselves and our wants, desires, needs, and transferring our focus to the Lord. That's how he answers every prayer. He doesn't answer every prayer if you're not praying his prayers. Some of you may remember a sermon that uh, Brother Mike Williams preached. I, I, I can't remember if we listened to it as a prayer groups or, or how that worked, but many of you have listened to it. But he, he looked at that word without ceasing. And he, he noticed it was a compound word. And he, Paul's the only person in the Bible that uses it. And Brother Williams believes Paul kind of made it up as a compound word. And the, the main root word means remnant or leftovers. And the prefix dia means without. So Paul is saying pray without remnant. And another way of saying that would be pray without the baggage of the unanswered prayers of the past. Prayer that doesn't yield to my doubts of my past is powerful prayer. I pray today, and I'm not thinking about yesterday's prayers. I'm, take, I'm thinking about today's prayers. Me and God are having a conversation today. Yesterday we had a different conversation. Yesterday he decided to do whatever he did. Today is a new day. Today is a new conversation. God's good today. God's able today. God's strong today. So we need to have our prayers unencumbered by what is behind us and pray like it's the first time. Pray like God is all-powerful. Pray like God could do anything He wanted to do. Pray like God is sovereign. Pray like God is in charge. So let me put those two together in one sentence if I could. Much longer than our text. Our, the Bible is so much more efficient. Pray without ceasing means interacting with God by replacing our wishes for His as He gives us the faith without the baggage of prayers unanswered in our past. Remember this upbeat letter to the Romans. Paul is writing from prison. So he should be thinking... God must be dead. Here I am in prison. I was faithful, and God put me in the slammer. What kind of God is that? Right? Wouldn't you be thinking that way? Hey, I get a flat tire, and before long, I'm blaming God. I was in jail, especially for preaching the gospel. I would say, God, I thought you were more powerful than these politicians. God, I thought you were more powerful than this, this heathen that threw me in jail here. And, and God says, I'm more powerful. I just, I'm just letting him put you in jail because I have something else planned here. I need a letter to the Romans that the billions of people will read over history. And Paul is saying in his situation, he's not delusional. He's not a psychiatric patient. He's saying... Who will separate me from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Maybe he's asking himself, am I going to let all of this separate me from the love of God? Am I going to let the circumstances around me be more powerful than my trust in God? 
As it's written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And then he answers himself, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loveth. For I am persuaded, I have trust, I am persuaded that neither death, have you ever, have you, have you ever wondered why God let somebody die? Nor life, have you ever wondered why God's letting somebody's life be so miserable? Why did God let that person get abused? Why did let God, God let that person be in an accident in their whole life, their, their handicap? Or why, did let, why did God let that person have a, a mental uh, handicap and, and their whole life they can't even uh, function the way you and I function? I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, or, nor angels or principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that's up to you. It doesn't mean that nothing can come along and make you feel bad. If you want to, good things can make you feel bad. You can make up your own misery if you want to. There are people that do it. But if you want to, you can trust an almighty God and you can be persuaded that no matter how the things twisted and turned and no matter how your prayer was or was not answered, nothing, nothing can keep you from the love of God. He loves you no matter what is happening in your life. You have to decide that. Now, somebody put it this way. I think, in fact, it was Brother... Uh, Brother Williams, he said, Conspicuous, conspicuously absent from Paul's otherwise exhaustive list is the past. He says, nor things present, nor things to come, nor any, but he doesn't say the past. Because it's precisely the past that raises the white flag of surrender over our present. It's the past that casts its long shadow over our future. It's somebody or something from the past that smothers our faith with doubt. So, when I'm praying for someone with cancer, am I thinking about my mom all the time? Or am I thinking about my almighty God who is well able to do exceeding abundantly above all I ask or think? Am I talking about the creator who could create a new body if he needed to. No cancer is bigger than he is. He could have done it. If he didn't do it, well, that was up to him. I still trust him today. So Paul had this philosophy. He mentions it to the Philippians. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting. Would you say forgetting? Forgetting, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before, I press forward toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. When I pray and those past thoughts try to ruin this prayer, I forget what's behind me. Again, I'm not pretending it's not there. I'm not hiding my head in the sand. I'm saying, that was yesterday. I'm going to see what he says today. Yeah. Yesterday, he didn't do it the way I asked him to do it. But I'm going to just see what he thinks about this today. I'm going to, I'm going to talk to him today, even if yesterday he didn't do what I wanted him to do. How many of you have gotten down to three or four days, three or four years down the road, and you're glad he didn't answer your prayer that day? Now, once we get beyond our disappointments of yesterday, we can begin to believe and have confidence for today and tomorrow. So I do have to deal with yesterday. If I'm mad at God, I need to deal with that. If I'm angry with God, I, I need to go talk to Him. I need to tell Him I'm angry. I don't need to tell Him off, but I need to tell Him how I feel about it so He can help me with it. I might need to get counsel with that. I need to deal with yesterday. I need to admit it happened. But 
then I need to know that I'm not dealing with today or yesterday. I'm dealing with God. He's not even in days. He's outside of time. So I... I can forget yesterday, and I can try to not even pray for today or tomorrow like I want it to be. I can ask God, what does your today look like, God? What does your tomorrow look like? What do you want me to steward in prayer today? So I can apply these scriptures that Jesus spoke in his Sermon on the Mount. Take no thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And the, the New Living Translation says it like this. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Today I have my troubles. Today I deal with my troubles by talking to an almighty God who could do anything he wants to do. And tomorrow if I still have my trouble, he's going to be with me to take care of that too. Now, some of you may be already applying this to maybe what you've been dealing with emotionally lately. I've referred to it just a little bit, but I want to go, I, I, I go where the rubber meets the road. Uh, my wife and I pray every morning together, and last week God spoke to my wife, and he said this. I'm going to share this word that he gave my wife privately. He's, this, this was uh, when the election results started coming in, and uh, I was dealing with all the emotions of it. And I haven't told you which way I prefer. I've just told you I prayed the will of God. And I don't know which way will be best for the country, and I don't know what God's doing in the country, and I don't know if this election, uh, we still really don't know how it's going to turn out, but we all have emotions that are going through our minds and hearts. And, and this is what God said, because we had spent uh, e every Wednesday morning for four months, I think it was, we, we met here at the church and we prayed. And then the week before the elections, we spent four nights praying. And so we, we put a lot of energy into praying God's will be done in our country and in the world and with the election. And, and, and then it just seems like a bunch of confusion with the election. It's like, there's not even, uh, uh, I don't even know which way it went. And this is what God said. Distance yourself from the present world system. Yes, you are in this world. You will feel and fight and experience many things and be con connected to this world. But you are ultimately of the heavenly kingdom, not of this world. When you feel directed to pray and fight for things pertaining to this world, understand that it's the heavenly kingdom influencing the world system. It's never a measure of your relationship or your obedience to me. You live in two worlds at once, but it's only temporary. Your real allegiance is to my heavenly kingdom that awaits you. That's perspective. So I can be Elijah, and I can call fire down from heaven, and Jezebel still goes on being Jezebel, and I don't have to go into depression. He was human, like we are, but he went into depression because he didn't understand that. So he had to die not seeing Jezebel dethroned, although he really had a hand in dethroning Jezebel way back when he called fire down from heaven. Something broke in the spirit realm. I don't know if he'll mention it next week, but Brother Wright has mentioned on some of his Zoom calls that he believes that we have defeated the Prince of America. Well, you know, my brain immediately thinks, oh, well, now everything's going to be peaches and roses. But look at, look at scriptural times when things were defeated. Moses basically defeated Pharaoh the day he showed up in Egypt. But it took a long time, and he never did convince some of his church that anything good had happened. They died saying, what a poor pastor we have. What a guy who takes too much on himself and, you know, someone ought to take the mic away from him. That, that, and, and God reminded my wife of a prophecy 
that I brought back up for you to read with me today. God said this to us in August. My children, your faith is the substance of things hoped for. Your faith is the evidence of things not seen. You want to go to this place your pastor is talking about today, and I want to take you there. Soon we will go there for real. Put it into my hands. Go where I'm leading you. Remember, there's really coming a day when I will take you over the threshold. If you can think now when you worship me that the day will come, that when it comes there will be no more pain, there will be no more wrestling with your own spirit, there will be no more struggles, no more wars, no more lost loved ones in the background of your mind, no more work, then you will be at rest in my kingdom. I'm already in his kingdom. I'm already a part of the kingdom of heaven. It's just right now it's here on earth and he's going to catch me away. He's going to take me to that dimension. I need to fight for that kingdom right now, but I know that if it doesn't even seem to go well, if I die in the fight, I'm still in the kingdom. He said, if you can think of that when you worship me, knowing that by faith everything you hope for is real, your faith is the substance of things hoped for, your faith is the evidence of things not seen, worship me as though you were already there. Worship me as though every care were already fallen, as though every chain were completely forever broken, not to be remembered anymore. Worship me as though the thing that actually will be is here now. I have given you the earnest of my spirit. The Bible calls it an earnest of inheritance. I have already given you the down payment. And you can live above this world. You can live above this world in my spirit. There's a place I'm bringing you to. There's a place that you need to be that I'm leading you to. You can practice this. You can go there. I'm bringing you there. I'm leading you there. Now let me just pose something here. I'm not trying to scare anybody. But let's suppose that this country began persecuting Christians, beheading Christians. That's happened all over the world. See, you and I have lived in a pocket of human history where we have been in one of the most blessed countries in all of history. Blows my mind that people would want to throw that away. But because of that, we have had it We've been more blessed than most of the world is today and most of the world Christians have been historically. So all we're seeing is a little bit more of the reality that all the other Christians around the world have been seeing for years and historically Christians have seen for years. So right now, you think it's bad. I'm saying God might just be toughening us up a little bit and teaching us how to trust Him in hard times. Because who knows what it's going to take for us to have this great harvest. They, the world doesn't even hate us yet. They don't even know who we are hardly. We're pesky evangelicals who might mess up the vote right now. But they're not mad enough to kill us yet. If God, if God uses us like He said He's going to use us, and we're laying hands on the sick, and we're casting out devils, and it gets more and more obvious, and, and more and more obvious that we believe the Bible and not what everybody else is believing, they're going to get mad at us. Right? Like they did Jesus, like they did the disciples. And right now, most of us, if our neighbor got mad at us, if somebody sent us a dirty uh, letter or a bad email, or if one of us went to jail for what we believe, some of us would have this, this collapse of faith. Some of us would feel like, oh, where is God? Well, God is where He's been for all persecuted Christians. God's always faithful. God, God sometimes let people be persecuted. But He's good. He's faithful. I can trust Him. I can have joy. I can have peace, even in the midst of all of that. So, today is not yesterday, and you and I can look forward to even tomorrow. Well, how can we? Everything didn't work out the way I wanted to work, or maybe everything did work out the way you wanted to work out, but either way, you're figuring, it, you're figuring out tomorrow based on what you think is going to happen. I, I got news for you. You have no clue what's going to happen. You're probably wrong. Most of the time we are. But I know he's good and I know he's faithful. Why not trust in what I know instead of what I think I might know? So let me just close this by reminding you and I. I, I reminded our leadership of this a few months ago. You and I are really sent out into the world to be treasure hunters. My job is to go out there and find the hearts that are open to God. And I'm going to have to probably 
talk to ten people before I find one person that would even be open to God. So if I have a very tender personality, if I'm easily offended, I'm going to get offended nine times before I received one time. Uh, if, I, if I don't toughen up, I won't even get through the whole ten, and I'll never find the person that I'm supposed to be finding. One of the most <clears throat> watched documentaries on the History Channel is called The Curse of Oak Island. <clears throat> there's an oak, <clears throat> there's an island called Oak Island. <clears throat> it's 140 acres of land up in Nova Scotia, less than a mile wide, or long rather, and a few thousand feet wide. <clears throat> and it's the location of the longest running and most expensive treasure hunt in the world. It started in the 1700s. There's all kinds of ideas of, of what is buried there. Some people think the Ark of the Covenant might be there. and It's the, the Knights Templars buried lots of stuff there. The, a lot of treasures, Shakespeare's original documents might be there. There's all kinds of ideas what's buried there. And uh, six men have died trying to find that treasure so far. And, and currently, that, that program that's on called The Curse of Oak Island was... Um, really launched by Rick and Marty Lagina. There are a couple of Americans who have put, with their investors, millions of dollars into it, and then the TV program put like five or ten million dollars into it, and then they got a matching grant for a couple million dollars, so there's like tens of millions of dollars put into this thing, and so far they've found a few artifacts here, and there you see a picture of them in the middle at the bottom. There's the big equipment they're using nowadays. They used to dig all the holes by hand, and they had to walk down the old hand-hewn timbers and things like that. And now they're, they're using massive equipment, and they're, they're spending millions of dollars to find that thing. Why? Because they don't believe today is yesterday. Ah, we just found little things yesterday, but today, <laughs> we're going to find the big stuff today. And it keeps him going to the, I mean, it's almost like ludicrous. I wonder if that could be said of me. Brother Hanson, you've been saying we're going to have an end time revival. And, and we've grown and we've, we've started a couple of churches. And we've, you know, some good things have happened even in days where less people are going to church. But nothing like you've been saying is going to happen. I don't know. Yesterday we tried this and it didn't work and it didn't happen. We prayed. Remember we did that and we had that, that initiative. And, you know, nobody came from that. And we did that and nothing happened. And so I don't know. Let's just not worry about anything. You think that today is yesterday. And if God came to you and said, let's do this today, you would tell God himself, oh, God, I don't think that's you. You know, it must not be you because I tried that already and that didn't work. Moses, well, we tried lice and it didn't work. Yeah, let's try frogs. Well, yeah, we tried frogs and that didn't work. Well, let's just get all the cattle sick. <laughs> God, that, these guys are so strong-willed, and, and, and Pharaoh, I, I keep going back, and he's just not going to budge. And then finally, the firstborn works. Yeehaw! We finally won the war. We head out, following the cloud. And what does God, this almighty God, who's supposed to know what he's doing, where does he move the cloud? To a dead end. And everybody does what you and I do. Pastor doesn't hear from God. <laughs> That's probably not even a cloud from God. God wouldn't do this. God's not that stupid. Why would he take three million people into the wilderness with no food and water? God is not that dumb. And look, there's a cloud behind us. Here they come. Oh, no. Now we're out here. Now we're going to all die. Look what happened. And some of us just are good at being negative like that. We almost enjoy being negative like that. And God says to Moses, just stand still. I'm going to do something you've never seen happen before. I'm going to do something that's never been done in the history of mankind before. And if Moses would have listened to his elders, or, or some of his elders, if Moses would have listened to the masses, if Moses would have gone on Facebook and, and taken a poll, 
What do you think, guys? Should I stand up all night holding my rod out, or should I even worry about it? <laughs> oh, Moses, you're, you're, you're getting old anyway, and you know, that's a lot of work. And <laughs> Whoever heard of holding the rod over the water? That's, I mean, now history shows this flowing beard and this man standing there, oh, and everybody's saying, yeah, good old Moses. But, but that day, the church was looking I'm like, what got into the pastor? And this guy is up on an all-night prayer meeting? What in the world? Why pray? We can see him coming. We might as well just wave the white flag and say, okay, we're coming back to build some more pyramids for you. But God is saying this is today. Today I'm going to do something I didn't do yesterday. Today I'm going to move you. Today I'm going to, I'm going to take care of things. Well, God, if you had any sense, if you had any power, you'd just kill Pharaoh. You wait. Just wait. I'm going to take care of him in one fell swoop. I am going to snuff him out. I am going to let him get so proud. I'm going to let him overreach. I'm going to let him go where he shouldn't go. And then I'm going to take care of the greatest monarch on the earth, the greatest leader on the earth. I am going to snuff out without a single sword, without any kind of intellect, without any kind of master plan, without anybody even knowing what they're doing. Just an old guy with a rod holding his hand over the water saying, I, I stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. That's all I know how to do. But you got to quit thinking you got it figured out or you need to tell God how to figure, how to figure it out. Some of us are like the, the TV talking heads that they think they need to figure everything out. They, they get it wrong half the time. We pay them to go back and tell us what they think the next time. I don't know why we watch them for hours and hours and hours getting it wrong. All sitting around talking about how things should go and, and nobody gets it right. The polls don't get it right. Everybody's just hoping for what they want and they're talking themselves into believing it's going to happen that way. Why don't we talk to God and see what He thinks? Why don't we ask God about today? Why don't we ask God about tomorrow? And why don't we stop even making it about America? God has a worldwide harvest. It's so much bigger than America. So just to put my flesh in place, just to go to the gym today, I'm going to ask you to do this, if you would. We're going to shift to worship, but if you'd stand with me right now, the, the rest of the service is going to be trying to sing like we believe God's alive and well, trying to have enough confidence and trust in God that we can believe and as we sing, if you want to stand or sit, whatever, we're just going to have a good worship time here today. But before we do, I'd like for every family in the, the building during this next song, just take your time so not everyone's coming at once. I'd like someone from every family to come get one of these Bible studies. There's four stacks of Bible studies here. It's a Bible study we produced years ago here at this church called One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism. And it's a very short 12-page booklet that we can give, you can just give to anybody, but uh, you could teach it too very easily. If you can read, you can teach it. You read it and say, what should we put in that blank? Okay, let's put that in, and you're, you're done. You don't even have to hardly know anything. You don't even have to know how to look up scriptures because they're all written right here in this little pamphlet. But it, it talks about being saved. It talks about the power of putting the name of Jesus on your life through baptisms. It talks about the power of the Holy Ghost as you're filled with the Spirit. And, and I've taught a lot of these to people who aren't here today. So I get one of these out and think, you know what, I'm going to go teach a Bible study. And my brain says, done that. Didn't work. Some of you have some of these sitting at your house. You, you didn't have the courage to go get somebody because it's like, I don't want to be disappointed again. But God is trying to teach us to believe in him so much that, uh, forgive the illustration, it just works for me and so I use it again and again. If I had a plate of teriyaki chicken that I loved more than anything in the world and I was standing in the mall 
And I was saying, would you like some? Half the people wouldn't even try it. And a lot of the people would, eh, mm. But a few, you'd turn them on to the greatest food in the world. Some of us, me included, just naturally speaking, I wouldn't touch a job like that. I would be miserable in a job like that. Because I want people to be happy about what I have. I want everybody to take what I have. I want, that just, there's no place in the world where that exists. If you have kids, you know, you can't even talk your kids into good things. So, God has promised us a worldwide harvest. He's promised us that in the last days, it's, 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 all, it's like, scripturally speaking, that the world's going to get full of people, and then He's going to reap that harvest. And He's told us in Scripture, and many times even in prophetic words to us, that you're going to see and do things you've never seen and done in all of your life. But yesterday wasn't like that for me. So I'm a little hesitant to get out there again. So I, I challenge each one of you to take one of these home and pray about that treasure that God wants you to find. And if it takes you a dozen Bible studies, oh well, that's how this harvest is going to happen. What happens is, just like in, in gold mining, in any kind of mining, especially under the earth kind of mining, you dig and dig and dig and then you hit a vein. And when you hit that vein, it's like, whoo, our church went from 200 to 500 in two years. How'd that happen? You hit a vein. But if you weren't digging, you would never hit that vein. So we're going to begin to worship, and we're not going to have an altar time. We're going to go to the gym. We're going to actually pick up that Bible study, and we're going to believe God to do today what He didn't do yesterday. We're going to believe somebody will respond to the gospel today, even though yesterday somebody didn't respond to the gospel. And we're going to pray today the will of God, because he's told us, I, it is my purpose to do this. And you know what? If a, an economy has to collapse to do it, if COVID has to respike to do it, whatever has to happen, I don't know, but I'm with God. I don't know how he's going to get it done. I don't know what's going to happen to make it happen, but I'm going to reach for souls. Are you still with us? Are you believing for this thing? As they begin to lead us in worship, just take your time. Space yourself out. Every, I think there's enough for every family to have one of these. And at the end of service, if you see a few left, they're all free. God bless.